Good afternoon from Europe and good morning to those on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, my name is Rosa Balfour. I'm the director of Carnegie Europe and I'm joined today by Dan Baer, who's the acting director of the Europe program in uh, Carnegie in Washington. And we're absolutely delighted to have two extraordinary guests today to talk about um, transatlantic relationship the administration. Uh, we're joined by Karen Donfried, who is the US Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and for Eurasian Affairs since September 2021. Uh, prior to this position, she was president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, where I had the privilege to work with her. Um, and before then had several appointments in government at the National Security Council, at the National Intelligence Council, in the State Department's uh, Policy Planning Unit. Um, we're also joined by David Tvar, who is the Director of, um, for European Affairs at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, previously was Ambassador to Sweden, advisor to the French President on the Middle East, and has held several positions in Paris, Washington, Iran, um, several diplomatic positions, of course. Um, what we'd like to do today is uh, focus very much on current affairs, given that um, the transatlantic relationship and um, are you know, heavily engaged with uh, what is happening uh, in Ukraine, the um, crisis in Ukraine, but also take a deeper look at what the transatlantic relationship has achieved over the past um, 12 months and where the difficult areas are, where the areas of convergence are, and take a, a deep look at this rather than just uh, follow the um, headlines of the news. Um, we will engage with our speakers uh, for half an hour, 40 minutes, and we would welcome questions from the audience. You can send them in through our Twitter address, which is at Carnegie Europe, or through the YouTube chat, and we'll do our best to reflect all the, um, all the um, questions that will be coming in. So, my first question, I'll, I'll start with Karen. Um, you've been traveling to Europe a lot these days, and uh, there's been a lot to talk about, but of course the crisis in Ukraine has probably taken up a lot of your time. We've seen that by comparison to, for instance, the US withdrawal with Afghanistan or the AUKUS agreement, there's been a lot more engagement uh, by the US with European um, allies. Um, can you? Tell us, you know, how does this look, both from the point of view of the crisis in Ukraine, um, you know, newspaper articles evolve literally every hour on, you know, monitoring this situation and the degree of unity of the transatlantic um, relationship. How does this look from your perspective? Well, first, Rosa, it's such a delight to see you and Dan, and I'm just thrilled to be doing this together with David. And I think it's a wonderful example of the importance and power of transatlantic cooperation. And certainly when President Biden came into office, he underscored that Europe is a natural partner for the US. And he's been very focused on revitalizing and strengthening transatlantic alliances and partnerships. And the French EU agenda is a great example of the many areas that we can work together. Um, you mentioned in particular Ukraine, Russia, that has been a particular focus in recent weeks because we have been very concerned about the massive troop buildup that Russia has underway on its border with Ukraine. And now we see Russian troops moving into Belarus as well. And you've seen a great deal of activity on the part of the administration in terms of pursuing really two paths. One path is a path of diplomacy. And I was with Secretary Blinken last week in Kyiv, in Berlin, in Geneva, where he began by meeting with our Ukrainian partners and reaffirming US support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and emphasized the strength of this partnership with Ukraine. We went on to Berlin where the secretary not only had the chance for a first in-person meeting with Germany's new chancellor, he was able also to continue the ongoing conversation with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Baerbock. And then there was a meeting of the Quad, where, of course, 
the crisis around Ukraine loomed large. And then in Geneva, he had the meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov. And as was announced there, the United States this week will be handing over a non-paper to Russia in response to the two documents that Russia had shared with us, one about U.S.-Russian relations, the other about Russia-NATO relations. And we believe deeply that the only successful solution to this crisis is a diplomatic one. We don't know if the Russians will agree with that, but Secretary Blinken is very invested in pursuing that path of diplomacy. At the same time, we also have a path of deterrence and defense where we've been working extremely closely as we have in the diplomatic path. And just let me say in the diplomatic path, you've had the bilateral piece, the US-Russia piece through the strategic stability dialogue. We've also had the NATO-Russia Council and we've also had the OSCE engaged. So we've been working very closely with the EU and our European partners on the diplomacy. We've also been working very closely with them on building a package of deterrence that includes, among other things, financial sanctions and export controls. And we've also been providing security assistance to Ukraine. And we've been making sure that NATO is focused also on buttressing its eastern flank, given what's happening in that neighborhood. So in all of this, the partnership with Europe is essential and is a unique strength that the United States has. And I will say that Secretary Blinken, President Biden has spoken to this as well. We've been so heartened by the cohesion and unity that there has been across the Atlantic on how best we can meet this particular challenge from Russia. So let me stop there, thanks. Karen, can thanks. I just follow up on this? Sorry, Dan, I'm just, just sorry. Tomorrow we have a, um, a weekly, a bi bi-monthly blog called Strategic Europe where Judy asks a difficult question. Judy Dempsey asks a difficult question. <laughs> and tomorrow it's coming out on, will is Germany damaging Europe's position on this? And you're a great expert on Germany. And there's been a lot of attention to the different, uh, to the uncertainty because of the new government in Berlin um, and to how difficult it is for Germany to overcome certain positions with respect to Nord Stream 2, uh, with respect to allowing the sale of NATO arms to Ukraine. Um, and, and it's been difficult. How much, or at least it appears difficult, how much time have you been spending on working on the cohesion of, of uh, European allies and in particular on Germany? So obviously each, each of us comes to this uh, with, with different ideas and different priorities, but I don't think there's been any particular tension with Germany here. Germany is a critical ally and partner in how we're meeting this challenge. And Germany's perspective is no different from other European allies and partners or from the United States in looking at what is happening on Russia's border with Ukraine and saying, if there were to be a further military incursion by Russia into Ukraine, the implications of that for Ukraine, of course, are enormous and deeply disturbing. But the implications also go far beyond Ukraine. This would be a fundamental rewriting of the European Security Act uh, architecture after the end of the Cold War. And the implications go beyond Europe as well. So Germany is deeply engaged with us and, and with other European allies and partners in saying, how do we best respond to this, both through diplomacy, but also by trying to deter Russia from this behavior. And if Russia, in fact, does engage in further military aggression against Ukraine, we will be ready. And that includes Germany. We will be ready to immediately confront Russia with massive consequences and severe costs. And that particular phrase, slightly different words have been used, but you've seen that phrase appear in NATO conclusions, in European Union conclusions, and in conclusions of the G7. And Germany is a proud member of all of those organizations. So I am struck by the unity and the common effort that we're all putting forward here. 
And the new German government has been a terrific partner on this. So I, I would leave it there. I'm glad I'm grateful for your uh, your optimism about that. I want to turn to David um, and ask you, you know, there's there's a lot going on right now. I, I gather that uh, in Paris today, in fact, as we speak, there's a kind of uh, reunion of the so-called Normandy format of uh, Russia, Ukraine, Germany and France. Uh, we'll see what comes out of that meeting. And then obviously, uh, President Macron has announced that he's going to have a phone call with President Putin this Friday. And I wonder what the view looks like uh, from Paris to you about this crisis and whether you're as optimistic as Assistant Secretary Donfried is about, about the unity. And then also, if I could push you a little bit, you know, um, President Macron has said in recent days that he sees a, a, a way for more of an ununified um, approach to Russia, where there might be a distinct French or a distinct European position that he would pursue. And I wonder if you could help us understand whether that is incompatible with uh, the kind of unified allied response to, uh, to uh, President Putin's menacing position on the border of Ukraine right now. Uh, how do you see those things uh, fitting together? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. I hope you can hear me, um, although you probably can you well. see me. Uh, okay. anymore. I seem, I seem to be frozen, but it's, uh, it's not much of a loss. Uh, I'm sorry for the technical uh, uh, glitch. Uh, first of all, I, sh I should say I, I totally agree with what Karen uh, said. And before you tell me I'm being too diplomatic, I should point out that last time we met was here in Paris in the context of the AUKUS discussion. And so when we have disagreements, we don't hesitate to, uh, to say so, but it's absolutely not the case uh, here. Uh, indeed, um, I think the, the, the urgency is to have a, a unified uh, a strong stance on the, um, um, on the massive sanctions and the severe costs that we, that, that we are collectively ready to inflict on Russia if it... Uh, if it uh, um, goes into a further aggression in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, I will also point out, I mean, in my memory, I, I don't recall tougher uh, EU Council statement than, 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 than this one that we had back in December. Um, and words, uh, of course, uh, matter. Um, so, you know, we need to have uh, a clarity on the diplomatic path uh, forward uh, and on, on, the, on the sanctions we are ready to use. And on, on both those tracks, I think we've had a, we have excellent diplomacy going on between us, uh, with, uh, with our partners, uh, with Russia as well. I think Mr. Putin, if he tries to see uh, differences in what he hears from, from, from our leaders, he's probably uh, disappointed. And I think that's, that's the key in this phase. Um, and your second point, I, I uh, disagree with your is that uh, there would be somehow a separate French or French-German track uh, in discussing with, uh, uh, with uh, Russia. That's not what uh, President Macron said last time in, uh, in Strasbourg. You just can go back to the, to the speech itself. Um, it's uh, what he does advocate for, and that's not new. It's been, uh, it's been there for a long time. It's part of his uh, signature, if I may say so. Uh, he, he feels that um, the EU, of course, must be present when European issues are being discussed, um, but we are in agreement uh, with this, uh, with our American uh, friends. He feels also that it's, uh, I think it's quite uh, clear that it's a tough world out there, and uh, the Europeans and the EU in particular must develop uh, its own strategic uh, thinking. I think in the US, you've never stopped to, ha to develop your strategic thinking in a, in the EU, um, we have uh, somehow, um, in the past decades, uh, we so, so somehow been accustomed to uh, not thinking about these issues as much as we as we used to uh, during the during the Cold War. And it's uh, it's absolutely necessary for us to do that. I think we'll come back to it in the discussion on the EU and how EU policies evolve. Uh, but I think they are they are increasingly becoming more strategic, and that's something we we intend to encourage. Uh, in our role as presidency of the of the uh, um, of the European Council, if I could follow up on that real quick, um, I think uh, you would find broad support in the American 
uh, both in the American government and in the kind of policy community more broadly for the idea of a more strategic EU, it does seem that um, sometimes when that conversation is raised, there is implicitly a um, assumption that the conclusion of a strategic process within the EU would be more distanced from the United States rather than growing closer to the United States, which I think many of us on this side of the Atlantic think that actually the future of both the United States and the EU lies in clo ever closer bonds um, because of the big bad world that is out there. And I wonder if, if that is, um, if you notice also an ex ante judgment that sometimes the discussion of strategy seems to have already assumed a conclusion that the EU would be uh, further from the United States rather than closer to the United States. And then, uh, you know, um, I wonder if taking a step back from the immediate crisis of Putin's uh, threat against Ukraine and by implication all of Europe, whether you could say something about what the French presidency, I know you, you had an agenda that was that has been in some sense distracted from by, by the current crisis, what 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 is the French presidency's priority with respect to the transatlantic relationship and how, how did the policy priorities fit with the transatlantic relationship going forward? Uh, there is a lot there, uh, Dan. I'll try to uh, I'll try to, to be brief. Um, I agree, and it's sometimes a bit of a surprise for us in, in, in France that um, what should be a no brainer that uh, Europe becomes more strategic and develops more capabilities, um, ends up very quickly in incredible theological discussions where actually it's all about the implicit. So one of the implicit is that France's uh, um, ambition there is uh, you know, some kind of middle-sized power haunted by its former glory, trying to uh, punch above its weight with uh, EU uh, financial support or that kind of stuff. Uh, or, you know, go list uh, uh, third way uh, uh, aspirations, uh, which, by the way, I, I think is uh, historically wrong, as the goal was very clear that he was in the Western camp. Um, or another implicit is uh, that I see sometimes uh, in, the, in the discussion is that um, sometimes our own weakness is perceived as the best guarantee that the U.S. will continue to care for us and to care, care about us. Uh, which I think is uh, uh, an extremely dangerous uh, slope uh, to be on. In my view, there is no doubt that uh, if we develop a partnership, um, if we, it will strengthen and not weaken uh, the, the relationship. Um, it's not, frankly, it's not easy to do because partnership is not the, the is, is not the pattern of our relationship. Our relationship is leadership and, and followership, and we've been very comfortable, uh, I think, on both on, on, on both sides of this equation. Uh, so I think the, the U.S. must uh, grow uh, comfortable with uh, having partners, and, and the EU must grow comfortable with becoming uh, a genuine partner. Um, and to me, that's the guarantee of the sustainability of the transatlantic uh, relationship. That's what um, that's what will ensure that politically. On both sides, we can demonstrate, uh, politicians can demonstrate to the public that there is something in it for us. Uh, that's why we shouldn't be too, I think we shouldn't um, romanticize the relationship too, uh, too much. Um, it's a, it has had, had ups and downs from the very, very beginning. Um, and what, um, what matters is that we help, uh, we help each other face the big challenges we have ahead of us. And I would argue, if you look at them, that um, certainly they cannot be met by uh, Europe alone. I, I'm not sure they can be met by the US alone. Uh, and so I would argue that today, more than ever, uh, we need to, um, to work together. It's easier said than done, because a lot of what we need to do together involves, in this you know, connected world, uh, involves um, domestic policies uh, and norms. Uh, and so there is a lot of work to do there, and I can tell you it's not easy because it's what we do inside the EU, uh, where we have a pretty complex machinery uh, that ensures permanent both political and technical uh, discussions uh, on, on these issues. And I think we need to develop something uh, to the same effect um, between, uh, between the US and Europe. Thank you very much, David. Yes, Karen, please. I can just jump in. 
Dan, you mentioned the Normandy format discussions that are taking place today, and David didn't have a chance to, to comment on that, but I just do want to highlight that other critically important diplomatic track. And the United States is fully committed to trying to help facilitate implementation of the Minsk agreements in support of the Normandy format. So that foursome of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany. And we are very happy to see that meeting of political advisors happening today. And we, I'm in constant touch with my French and German counterparts and with also the Ukrainians and the Russians about Minsk diplomacy and how we can help facilitate that. Because obviously the conflict in the Donbass is part of this larger crisis. So I just want to be clear the extent to which we support that. And also it's something the secretary raised with Foreign Minister Lavrov as well, foot stomping U.S. support for uh, implementation of Minsk through the Normandy process. And just, you know, to David's underlying point and, and the question about transatlantic unity, I do believe that both Americans and Europeans think we are stronger together. So we have a shared interest in meeting this crisis together. It's based on the values we share that have been widely articulated in foundational documents of European security about respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, about the right of countries, their sovereign right to choose their own security and foreign policy and their right to join alliances. There are so many principles that are at play here that connect us across the Atlantic. So it's both the values and the interests. And we've seen this Russian playbook before. The United States and Europe lived through 2014. So we are poised to meet this challenge in a very different way than we were in 2014. And we've been explicit in saying that the measures we are contemplating putting in place should Russia engage in further military aggression are measures we did not contemplate in 2014. So this is a different order of magnitude. And I think that also underscores the cohesion that is there across the Atlantic. Now, all that said, so I may feel that we're in a very good place in terms of transatlantic unity. I don't know what Vladimir Putin is going to decide to do. We don't know if he's made a decision about what he's going to decide to do. So we, together with our European allies and partners, are trying to affect that. But ultimately, he will make that decision about how Russia will behave. And then, you know, we get to that next point, which is we, Americans and Europeans, are ready to react should he not choose that diplomatic off-ramp. And I don't think any of us should be sanguine about what could play out over the coming weeks. And we need to be prepared for further Russian military aggression that would confront Europe, confront the U.S., confront the global system with a very serious challenge. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for clarifying this, because sometimes a lot of the attention is focused on disunity amongst the allies, but actually the challenge is actually lies elsewhere, and it is precisely Russian actions in the Ukraine. Um, I'd like to uh, just broaden this out a little bit about the transatlantic relationship without romanticizing it, as David said, um, uh, but also focusing on, on, on its strengths and weaknesses and the problems that there have been. So to mark the first year of the Biden administration, we brought together some of Carnegie's brains um, to put together a compendium, making an assessment, and but also making the assessment of the past year in a forward-looking way. And we found that in certain areas, there have been considerable progress, one of them actually being Eastern Europe and the Balkans and the degree to which Europe and the US is cooperating in this part of the world. Security and defense is also another. Um, and of course, the Trade and uh, Technology um, Council. So I'd like to ask you just you know, briefly, how do you see these initiatives? But also, where do you see remaining gaps and problems? Um, I think some of the differences lie also in different worldviews. It's not just about particular interests. It's also about different ways of seeing the world. I mean, it could be that once we get to the end of this 
uh, well, hopefully diplomatically get to the end of this tunnel, it could be that the transatlantic relationship will actually form a new sense of purpose. I mean, for NATO, that is um, certainly po uh, possibly the case. Um, but, but still, there are gaps and and um, and uh, problematic issues. So, how do you evaluate them in the first months of your um, of your role as um, um, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Europe? Well, Rose, I really appreciate your flagging the larger transatlantic agenda that's there. Um, obviously, the crisis around Ukraine and Russia's very aggressive stance. And you know, just to remind, we see over 100,000 Russian troops along Ukraine's border today. I mean, Russia clearly is the aggressor here, but there is a much larger agenda that connects the US and Europe. And we need to be and are continuing to move out on that because there are also so many other global issues that connect us and concern us. Um, I mean, surely one of them is how do we provide the developing world with high standard, transparent, and climate resilient infrastructure? And you've got the EU's global gateway, you've got the Build Back Better World. That's an area where we're working very closely with the EU and the G7 on. You also have the global health challenge of COVID and the extent to which we are working with the EU. I mean, it's really hand in glove as we think about how do we boost global manufacture and supply of vaccines and therapeutics. I mean, there's so much that we're doing together in that space that is critical. Uh, and then you also mentioned technology and we had the Trade and Technology Council meet for the first time in the fall in Pittsburgh. And I think both sides saw enormous opportunity there because in recent years, we focused on the things that divide us around technology, that maybe Europeans are more concerned about privacy and Americans are less concerned. But what we realized is there's so much more that connects us. And really, this is the moment for the US and the EU to think about how we have a democratic governance approach to technology. And that goes from addressing supply chain vulnerabilities to setting standards for emerging technologies. And so we have this set of working groups that are very actively engaging to move forward on the whole host of issues that the Trade and Technology Council identified. And that what the outcomes of those working groups will be the basis for that next TTC meeting. So I think there are this whole host of issues where we've set out cooperation together over the past year, and we are continuing that even as we focus a great deal of our intention on trying to avert uh, further Russian military aggression against Ukraine. David, um, can we can we discuss the French presidency and and or, sure. or maybe the French pres the president the presidency that would have been absent this crisis in terms of what the agenda was and 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 what you will what you envision France still trying to pursue, particularly as it relates to the transatlantic relationship. And I, I was struck by your point, which I think resonates a great deal, which is that um, in some ways, kind of the transatlantic relationship has become harder as it's become deeper because we're working on issues that that reach deeply into domestic governance questions um, in a way that um, a purely military alliance, for example, doesn't as as obviously. And so I, I think some of the issues that the EU is tackling are are actually thornier and require more of our diplomats um, than than other issues do. And I wonder uh, I wonder what the French presidency entails. Exactly, uh, you you summed it up very nicely. Uh, and sorry, I I, uh, I didn't answer on the presidency, so I'll do it now. And also echoing what uh, what Karen um, uh, said. You know, 14 months ago, it would have been very easy to to say what we disagree on with the U.S. administration. Um, at, <laughs> we could have spent the whole hour on this. Um, now is not the case, uh, and I think the question for us now is not what to do, but how. If we look at what, we are remarkably aligned. And if I look at our agenda as presidency, and mind you, it's not, uh, of course, it's the French presidency, but it's an agenda that is actually, that has started before us, and will, start, uh, will continue later uh, after us for, for, for the biggest uh, part, huh? because we're talking about legislation that is being negotiated over months, sometimes years, 
um, they seem to me to be very close to the agenda of the Biden administration. So first, the, the digital and the climate uh, transition. Um, second, um, I would say, uh, you know, rule of law, education and social policies, everything that can uh, allow us to uh, strengthen the fabric of our societies, which I think we see on both sides of the Atlantic uh, being, being tested. Um, and on, on these issues, uh, it's not only, but it's a lot uh, about rules and norms. Uh, and indeed, it, it gets a bit tricky uh, when you start um, uh, negotiating these issues. And that's where I'm interested in this trade and technology council, because it's an area that um, has started not, not long ago. But uh, if we manage this well, that's, that's one of the areas where we can have the kind of discussion we have on a daily basis in the in the EU, which is you know the EU is not a postmodern, uh, at least it's not entirely a postmodern world where everybody loves each other. Uh, the negotiation between us is horrible, very tough, um, but but it delivers uh, because we know ultimately that uh, we need to have an agreement. It will make all of us stronger, and on on these issues there is no. Uh, single domestic solution, obviously, to climate change, to regulating uh, uh, tech. Um, and even on, on issues like education and social policies, uh, which are very national uh, by nature, we see a strong added value uh, for, 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 for Europe. Um, there is a third leg of our agenda, which is this one more specifically, I think, a challenge for Europe, but will um, uh, benefit the transatlantic relationship. And that's maybe where the fact that we are heading the presidency at this moment can be useful, is that we need to reconcile, to reconcile the EU uh, with the notion of, of power, basically. Um, the EU was specifically designed against this notion because it had not worked too well for, for the Europeans' uh, power politics uh, in, the, in the previous uh, century. And so we... Uh, uh, in a, to a large extent, the procedures we've put in place, they, they, they are aimed at dissolving uh, power politics, make sure we, we don't go back there, you know. And uh, I don't discard this, it's part of our history, and thanks to this we've built a, a great culture of cooperation, which is something we can also bring to the international discussion. But one thing we must stop believing, and I think we're in the process of stopping believing it, is that our main uh, foreign policy tool will be trade and the power of example. Uh, clearly, this does not seem to work with Russia. I don't think it works with China. I don't think it works. Uh, I'm not sure it works with Turkey. Uh, so we have to deal with the world outside as it is. Uh, and for that, we need to um, leverage uh, the instruments that we already have. Uh, everything revolving around uh, around trade, I would say, uh, and that's why our sanctions are no small thing. We are the biggest mature uh, market in, in the world. Um, so in the areas where we already have tools, we must be more assertive in using them, but we must also develop tools in the areas where we are weak, uh, typically in, uh, in defense and security. Uh, and I think on both those tracks, we can make, we, we, we have made some progress in, in the last uh, years, and we, we hope to, uh, to accelerate the pace under the French presidency. So that's where our, our uh, what was our agenda uh, for the French presidency actually uh, meets the challenges of the current situation pretty well. Exactly, exactly. Rosa? Well, yeah, we're receiving a lot of questions. Um, so I'd like to move directly to questions and then, um, and uh, Dan, maybe the questions that we have, we can save uh, one to the end. But there's one question actually for you, Dan, about the OSCE and what role it can play in solving the Ukraine crisis. Would you like to, um, would you like to tackle this? <laughs> sure. I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting the tables to be turned, but, um, you know, I, um, 
the OSE is like a car. It only works if you put gas in it, um, or at least like a traditional car, not an electric vehicle. Um, it only works if you put gas in it. And in, in that respect, I think um, what I've observed in the last few weeks, uh, as uh, Assistant Secretary Donfried said, is that the US and, and Europe have both have kind of given uh, the Russians some options of where where do you want to have serious discussions? We'll have serious discussions with you in Geneva. We'll have serious discussions with you in Brussels. We'll have serious discussions with you in Vienna. Um, and there may be a room for, for multiple discussions. One of the things, though, that I've spent some time thinking about in the last month is whether there's an opportunity. Um, you know, the OSC was born out of extended diplomatic efforts that lasted weeks and months in various European cities um, in the midst of the Cold War, uh, uh, it, another very difficult time. And whether there is an opportunity, um, if the Russians are actually interested in having a diplomatic effort, um, inter interested in engaging in real issues around conventional arms control, uh, around uh, strategic nuclear weapons, uh, interested in having a serious diplomatic effort to uh, address their concerns about European security while not violating the, the principles underlying it. Could there be a kind of extended diplomatic conference that, are, that grows out of this in the same way that, um, that there was in the midst of the Cold War? And if there is, that could be in a number of places and the OSC might be a useful platform. Um, there, the OSC has been a platform in the past for negotiations around conventional arms control, of course. And so um, if, if the Russians want to put gas in it, I think the uh, Americans and the Europeans have said, we're ready, we're ready to have serious conversations wherever, wherever you're ready to have serious conversations and we'll approach them in good faith. Uh, and um, that is a serious offer of diplomacy. And so I think the OSC can serve as a platform in that respect. And maybe if I can just jump in on this as well, one of the mantras that I'm sure everyone has heard us say is as we've approached the diplomacy around this crisis, we keep saying we, the United States, are not going to talk about Europe without Europe. We're not going to talk about Ukraine without Ukraine. And the level of consultation has been quite extraordinary. And, and there are fact sheets now that we're putting out about all of the consultation we're doing. But when you think about these three different channels of the diplomatic track, so in the strategic stability dialogue, which is the bilateral mm -hmm. channel, that's where we're discussing things like, you know, follow on to new start. There are some issues <laughs> that are bilateral, but there are a lot of issues the Russians have put on the table that are not. And so the NATO Russia Council is critical and NATO's participation is critical when you're talking about things like the future of NATO enlargement. And there the United States has been very clear that's a non-starter. We are not going to slam the open door shut on further enlargement. And then you get to the OSCE, which is the most inclusive of these channels. And of course, Russia is also a member of the OSCE. And the permanent council of the OSCE has weekly meetings. And while it is very hard to replace someone like Dan Baer, our current permanent representative there, Mike Carpenter, has brought tremendous energy to the OSCE track. And the Polish currently are the chair in office. And so we saw the Polish foreign minister say that the Poles are very interested in kicking off a revitalized European security dialogue at the OSCE. So I think there's a real opportunity to have that broader European security conversation at the OSCE. And it's certainly something that we are keen to see continue and will put a great deal of effort in as well. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Of course, the OSCE is the heir to what was established through the Helsinki process and then the Conference on Security and Cooperation. So it's really the institution that uh, represents the security arrangements that were agreed upon in the 1990s that Russia is uh, trying to, uh, he's trying to force um, revisionism of them. I'm trying to bunch the questions. So what I'll do um, is first ask a question which is partially related to this and it's from Philip uh, Breeden who uh, formerly was at the American College of the Mediterranean. He's asking, is it time to broaden the playing field and bring Russia's aggression to the Security Council and other international fora outside Europe? And then maybe I'll just bunch it in the interest of time together with another question about Turkey. And if the crisis worsens, what uh, can you count on Turkey 
um, uh, can you count on Turkey with eventual NATO-wide sanctions or in a combined NATO deterrence operation? This comes from our colleague Mark Pirini at um, Carnegie Europe, who was also formerly an EU ambassador to Turkey. Um, David, shall we start with you on UN Security Council and Turkey and then ask Karen and then maybe Dan, you could take the next couple of questions. Thank you. Um, I think it's important in this phase that we try to use, you know, all the, all the um, potential ways uh, of um, communicating or discussing. Um, and, and I think, uh, as we've said, both Karen and I, we're doing this reasonably well at the, at the, at the moment. Uh, the OSC, as we just said, um, I mean, the SCOE uh, is the logical framework to discuss about, about security. Uh, it was designed for it in a context of de-escalation. So we need to get to de-escalation probably before we can really uh, uh, go forward. Um, but it's, a, it's interesting. Uh, UNSC, uh, frankly, um, as far as I can see, I, I, I don't really see how it would, uh, given that, uh, that, that Russia is a permanent member, um, I don't. I don't really see what we could achieve there. I mean, maybe at a later stage. But uh, to to me, it, you know, the short term priority uh, is really to keep pressing on uh, this uh, message that we are uh, determined to having a, a meaningful uh, conversation with with uh, with Russia, but also um, determined uh, to adopt sanctions if uh, if if it's not interested. Um, on um, Turkey, I think, is really interesting. You know, we had uh, uh, and still have uh, some some uh, issues with uh, with with Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean, in in uh, in, in particular. Um, in general, I think we were quite concerned by what, what, what we saw as a as a as a pattern of uh, more. Um, let's say, uh, a politique of fait accompli by Turkey on, on, in various uh, in various theatres. Um, so uh, it would be interesting to see how it would react to such a policy uh, by, by, the, uh, by, by Russia. Um, and, and hopefully we could, uh, we could have a, a good coordination with Turkey as well. But I'm sure Karen will have a lot to add on this, uh, on this issue. Well, thanks so much. Uh, on the UN Security Council idea, I think it's a really interesting one. And certainly we want to continue to shine a spotlight on Russian's aggression, uh, Russian aggression, and make clear <laughs> what Russia is doing and the threat it poses. And I said earlier, we don't know at the end of the day what President Putin will do, but he clearly is putting in place massive capabilities which would allow him to undertake a very serious military invasion in Ukraine. And we need to be clear about that and we should be highlighting it, I think in as many fora as possible. Um, the question about Turkey, uh, I will say the secretary right before we went on last week's trip to Kiev, Berlin and Geneva, the Friday before he actually participated in a NATO foreign ministers meeting and our Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman has presented to the North Atlantic Council. I've been there a couple of times after trips to Kiev and Moscow to present to the NAC. And there has, Turkey has in no way been an outlier. The unity and cohesion that is there among allies is shared equally. So I really haven't seen that in the NATO context at all. And we've actually seen Turkey cooperating on a whole range of issues with Ukraine. I think all of you are tracking some of the cooperation around Turkish drones that uh, Ukraine it has, has purchased and is using. Um, on the sanctions point, I will say that our primary focus has been working with the European Union on the sanctions package. And you know we've been working with some of the individual member states, but the EU has a very important role to play on sanctions formulation. So that's been the focus. And certainly there, we're very happy to have other countries then come in and support those sanctions we're agreeing on. But in the first instance, that's been the focus on the sanctions front. Thanks so much. 
if I can um, jump in with a question for each of you, because there's there there are a couple of questions that are more tailored to to one or the other. But um, Karen, for you, um, former Congressman Jim Moran uh, has written in to ask: um, Given the previous Republican administration's position on Russia and the continuing influence of Mr. Trump, how reliable is the internal consensus in the U.S. on the current crisis? And David, um, for you. Uh, we have a question from Jean-François Boitin um, in Paris, and he asks, uh, with utmost respect for the speakers, it's difficult to ignore the various positions expressed by Germany, the historical relations between the SPD and Russia, and not to conclude that this is really a moment of truth for the EU, isn't it? And so I will, uh, Karen, uh, turn to you first and, and then David to you um, for those two questions that are a bit more edgy than, than what we've we've had so far. Well, it is perhaps not a surprising question from a former member of Congress about <laughs> domestic political cohesion on these issues. And, you know, I will say one thing I was really struck by during the Trump administration was how united the U.S. Congress was on support for NATO and concern about Russia. So, again, we live in a deeply polarized time in the United States. That is clear on so, so many issues. But I think when we're looking at this specific crisis around Ukraine that Russia is causing, I actually see a great deal of domestic political cohesion. Um, I talked about the extent to which we've been coordinating, consulting with allies. We also have been in very close consultation with the Hill on all of the things that we're doing. Um, and I do think that there continues to be a broad political consensus that NATO is our core alliance and members of Congress support that. And I think that's reflecting their view, the view of their constituents. And in the same way, there is deep concern shared across the aisle about what Russia is doing and believing that it is critically important that the administration stand strong and be tough in responding to that. So in this context of political polarization, I do think this set of issues is something that continues to enjoy a great deal of political consensus here in the US. Thanks. And David? Thank you. I think we must not miss the big picture here. Uh, and since it's a, presumably a French speaker who asked the question, I would say, you know, il faut pas regarder l'arbre qui cache la forêt. The big picture here is that we have remarkable coordination and alignment on what matters, which is uh, both the diplomatic track using all uh, venues uh, we, we, we can, and on the on very uh, on massive, you know, uh, sanctions that we are working on to try to deter an aggression and to respond to it if it happens. That's what ha really matters. I believe the rest is ma mainly noise. Uh, you have, uh, I was in Strasbourg last week when the president made his speech. So one sentence that you referred to made a lot of noise. And then later that day, President Biden also had a sentence on Ukraine made a lot of noise. And then Olaf Scholz has a sentence makes a lot of noise. Frankly, this doesn't matter. Um, I think what matters is the substance of what we are doing exactly as we speak. Uh, and um, and that, is, uh, that is pretty much where we should be um, and, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of a strong, strong coordination. Um, another thing I would say, though, uh, I do believe it's a moment of truth, but in a, maybe in a different sense. Maybe this crisis coming on top of, uh, of other crises that we have at the moment, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, mention uh, the China-Lithuania crisis, for instance, um, which is a China-EU crisis. Uh, I think this uh, should contribute uh, to this psychological shift we are advocating uh, in the EU, that we must become uh, a little bit more, you know, less vegetarian in a, in a, in a world of meat eaters. Uh, and so, of course, we will not become a formidable uh, hard power, uh, and we probably shouldn't uh, aim for that. Um, but we must leverage the tools we have and, and develop enough capabilities to be a more relevant and more powerful uh, actor in the field of defense, where at the moment we are less than the sum of our parts, if you look at the EU level. 
David, I'm going to steal your, I'm going to steal that phrase of uh, becoming less vegetarian in a world of meat eaters. And, and obviously one of the things about our conversation today is that it took until just now for, for China to be mentioned. And one of, one of the, um, the things that we should keep in mind is that uh, as we are focused on uh, President Putin's aggression, uh, we are leaving a host of other challenges uh, un, undiscussed, um, and and those challenges aren't waiting for us or or, or pausing uh, as 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 we are focused on on President Putin. And so uh, the U.S. and Europe will have other challenges to tackle as well uh, in the coming months. Rosa, do you want to? Yeah. Well, I think maybe we can um, give you a little bit of time and space on one issue about mutual misunderstandings. Um, what is it that America misunderstands of Europe? And I've mentioned here America, you know, America and Europe rather than the EU. And what is it that Europe misunderstands of, of, of America? I mean, um, we've talked a lot about how the transatlantic alliance is, is really um, collaborating, is really moving in on identifying the key issues, um, on recognizing the degree to which the world is changing and geopolitical trends are taking hold and how uh, those who are much more integrated and much more connected, such as the US um, and Europe, need to work together in order to um, manage these new challenges. Um, but what, what is it that um, that um, that is still, in, in your perception, what is it that is still a misunderstanding that is still not not fully um, that hasn't sort of sunk in your level of consciousness about about the transatlantic relationship, Karen. So it's interesting the way you phrased it, Rose. And I was trying to think about you know is it mutual misunderstanding or and it gets back also to the conversation or the question that that David was just answering, you know. The U.S. and Europe, this is a collection of sovereign countries, and we bring different experiences to the table. We have different geographies. So we are not clones. We have different perspectives, and that often might lead us to a different policy conclusion. But I think the power of consultation and coordination is that we come up with better shared decisions, right? So France may bring a particular perspective, US may bring a particular perspective. Oh, well, I don't agree. You say this, I say that. Well, then you sit around the table and you talk about it and you end up with a shared approach that I would argue is better than where we would have been had we been doing this on our own. And then you add in all of the other countries that are in play, whether you're in EU context or a NATO context, and it seems to me that we should celebrate this diversity. And it's not about the US saying, we've made a decision, you all need to line up and follow us. No, it's genuinely saying we are faced with incredibly vexing challenges, whether it's you know what Russia is intending to do uh, on Ukraine's border, whether it is the challenge of a rising China, climate change, COVID, all the things we've talked about. Um, we firmly believe that by engaging with people who share our values and share our interests and bring different experiences, we will end up with a better outcome. Now, that isn't always pretty. It's often messy. It's complicated. But when we coalesce around a common position, that gives us a unique strength. And it makes the United States stronger on the international stage than it would be were we acting alone. So, you know, I, I guess I don't see it as mutual misunderstandings. I see it as we are bringing our experience and our tools to the table and coming up with a package that agrees on united action. So, I don't see the, the differences as something that's negative. I think ultimately we are looking for complementary action on issues that we agree challenge us, challenge the transatlantic uh, community. So I, I don't see these things as bad. And I think when we look at the whole host of issues over this year, we've ended up with united positions. And I think Ukraine is at the moment the case in point because yes, these countries in Europe and the US bring 
different histories, different economic relationships, different political relationships to the table. And yet we have put together, if you take the deterrence package, we've put together a package that goes far beyond anything we were able to agree to in 2014. Mm -hmm. When you look at our cooperation on China, when you look at our cooperation across these vexing issues, I would say, look at that. And rather than focusing on the differences or the messiness, I feel very good about where we are at the end of January in 2022. So over to David. Thank you very much. Um... It resonates a lot with, with me what Karen says because it's my it's my almost my daily bread when it comes to the intra-European negotiation. Whenever we close a, a negotiation in Brussels, we have uh, one day to lament for all the French objectives that we are not, uh, you know, um, that we didn't get in the text, and then starting the second day we realize we've made a big European achievement. And by the way. Um, at this point as presidency, it's our role to be less French and more European and more honest broker. And it's, uh, it's very educational to have uh, every country doing this for six months uh, uh, in, in, in rotation. Uh, and I think that's exactly the spirit we must, we must develop in the trans transatlantic partnership as well. One thing in terms of misunderstandings or, or you know, maybe worth pointing out, maybe applies to the transatlantic relationship. It's certainly true. Uh, in Europe as well, even in, in, in every member state. I think we constantly miss um, the areas where Europe is strong and the areas where Euro Europe is weak. And therefore we have, uh, uh, I think sometimes we lose opportunities. Um, in, in every field of competence uh, of the EU, um, the EU is quite a formidable uh, actor, you know, and it's a remarkable legislator, in fact. It seems, it seems complex, but when you look at it, it's not that complex. It's actually, uh, I would argue, simpler than most national legislative processes uh, and sometimes even faster. We can credibly aim to close the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act under this presidency, and it was just presented a year ago. Uh, when you see the magnitude of this legislation, it's quite, it's quite remarkable, really. So in this field, um, in the field of trade, in the field of sanctions, in the field of norms, we, we are power. Um, if you go towards defense, uh, we, are, we, we are weak and we hope under the French presidency to develop a credible plan to you know, become over time a, a more relevant uh, actor. So I think it's important to make this distinction because people ask, very often ask either too much or sometimes not enough um, of, uh, of Europe. And I think if we look at the challenges we have ahead of us, um, and in this discussion we've talked a lot about Putin and, and Ukraine, which is completely normal given the circumstances, but it's also what Putin wants. <laughs> we must both address this, uh, this, this crisis, but also keep a, a longer perspective. And I think for the, for the big challenges that we want to tackle, um, uh, the EU has a lot has a lot to bring, and even in some of these areas, uh, some of these areas like climate change or others, is actually also a leader. So I see a great prospect for for a balanced and sustained uh, partnership between us. Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, let me bring this to an end. The um, time uh, suggests that we we have we have come to an end. Um, let me thank, first of all, allow me to thank Dan because we've been working together on transatlantic relations for the past year and it's been really a great partnership. Let me thank da uh, Karen and David for joining us today. It's been fantastic to have you and truly enlightening in terms of, you know, what kind of approach um, both sides of the Atlantic are taking to uh, dealing with what really is one of the greatest crises of our time. And um, I'd like to thank, allow me also to thank my colleagues whom uh, the audience cannot see, they're behind the screen, but they've really made a huge effort to put this together, Cyril Drissi and uh, Francesco Sicardi in particular. And then let me thank you all for, the, um, for your attention, for listening to us, for posting the questions that you posted. I hope we were able to, um, to um, convey them all to our speakers. 
And let me invite you also to take a look at the compendium that we put together marking one year of the Biden presidency. So without further ado, let me thank you all and wish you a good, uh, a good day and a good week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you, Rosa and Dan. Great to see everybody. Thank Great you. Great to see you too. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.